from the book of 1 Samuel 15, 34 and the following. Hear now the word of the Lord from the New Revised Standard Version of God's Holy and Precious Word. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gebeth of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. Chapter 16, verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and sand. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he would kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. If I suggest it to the sacrifice, I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to, the, to meet with him trembling, saying, do you come peacefully? He said, Peace, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. But when they came, he looked upon Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance, or on his height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, neither the Lord chose this one. Jesse made seven sons pass by before Saul, and Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, had beautiful eyes, and was handsome. Well, well, well. The Lord said, <laughs> rise. Knowing him. Yeah. Oh, this is the one. Yeah. Then Samuel took a horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mighty upon David from that day forward. Samuel then sent out, set out rather, and went to Rome. The word of God for the people of God. O oh Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and redeemer, the people of God said, Amen. 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 On this men's day, this is our first men's day. This is the first, the first annual. <laughs> every day. Uh, there you go. Every day is men's day. <laughs> Hallelujah. I am decreeing right now every fourth, what is it, fourth Sunday in June, yeah, yeah. make that men's day. Yeah, yeah. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. Men, men, you, you got a year now. You got your date. Put a team together. We're going to be reporting monthly, seeing what's going to happen. We're going we're gonna to do this thing all up. Women, we're going to catch up with the women folks. Yeah. There is a word from the Lord on this means day. I want to talk about anointing, but yet not appointed. Anointing, but yet not appointed. It had been a tough season for the prophet Samuel. He had earlier anointed Saul as the first king of Israel, in spite, you remember, of the protestations at the time. And Saul looked the part of the king. The biblical writer records Saul as being a handsome man. More handsome than anyone in Israel. And guess what? He stood a foot tall than everybody else in the land. Yeah. It is safe to say that Brother Saul was a tall, dark, handsome, 
And nobody really had a problem when Samuel anointed him the king of Israel. Because he was tall, dog, and handsome brother. Because he looked the part. So that must be the king. But in our text this morning, we see how Samuel agrees over Saul. Why? Well, why would the prophet who anointed him king grieve over him? Why would the tall, dog, and handsome brother warrant grieving in the first place? Well, earlier in chapter 15, in a complicated story, Saul found himself on the wrong, wrong side of what we have now interpreted as disobedience. The long and short of it is that Saul was disobedient to God because in the words of the prophet Samuel, he did not utterly destroy all of the Amalekites. He spared the life of the king Agag and kept all the best cattle and sheep for themselves and sacrifices to the Lord. Now, while I do not agree with the biblical writer's interpretation of that event as a real of God event, whether right or wrong or indifferent, Samuel declared Saul disobedient, and that day the kingdom was taken away from him. In short, for all of his good looks, for all of his nice appearances, for all of his supporters that he had, and all that was going on for him, Saul still lost the kingdom on that day. In other words, he got fathers. And I just thought about to tell the men and everybody else in this room who think that they're all that in a bag of chips. Ones who feel like they're so valuable that they cannot do a job without you. Ones who brag about how their job will never play out. Ones who are always getting by on their looks because somebody consider you fine or cute. I got news for you. You can still get fired. You can still get let go. When you sit up in here and think that your life is perfect and if people just like this did everything like you said it would be, that everything would be alright, if everybody does what you want to do, life still has a way of throwing you curveballs and have you going down swinging and making you look bad in the process. Samuel breathed for Saul. But he couldn't stay there because the word of the Lord came to Samuel to get up and set out. Fill up your horn with oil. Set out to anoint a new king of Israel. Samuel was afraid because Saul was still king. Saul's kingdom is taken away. But yet Saul is still king in the night. And if he found out that Samuel was anointed a new king, he would have been killed. And I need to stop right here because Samuel grieved about Saul because the kingdom had been taken away from Saul. But to everybody else, Saul was still king. Even though he sat on the throne, Saul knew that his days were numbered, and instead of just stepping down, Saul sits and later literally has a nervous breakdown mm. while on the throne. Mm. Huh? Because Saul knew he was living a lie. Yeah. Mm. Saul knew that he was not king. Probably told him that the kingdom would be taken away from him, but instead of stepping down, he remained on the throne and kept living a lie. Hard for us men sometimes to come to grips that we have not achieved what we thought we would have achieved right now. Hard for us men sometimes to reconcile the fact that we wasted so much of our youth on dumb stuff. It's hard to rec recognize and reconcile rather that the fact that we sometimes do not even expect the call from our children we have not been in their lives. Sometimes it's hard for us to see three, five, ten years down the road because we messed up so much in our past, we can only see the day. Now I know it's men today, but women, you can take heed to some of us. So what do we do? We live life. Still see ourselves as a playboy. Well, well, living on our good looks and our watered down version of a Mac game just to get over. <laughs> but when we look in the mirror, we see the truth, a broken down version of what we used to be. 40, 50, 60 year old that has nothing to really offer anyone than some tired, washed up, picked up lines and no lines.
But we see ourselves as successful. We got our acts together and God has blessed us and we come across as confident and assured yeah. down inside. We still in sin. Cannot commit to a real authentic relationship because we're scared that if the love of our lives find out the real of us, we would not know how to take that. Yeah. Yeah. So some men start dating folk half their age because we know that we are truly hit by the love of love because our conversation has not reached the level of maturity yet for a real one. Right. Yeah. 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 Sometimes you're so insecure, <laughs> though we may offer material things. We cannot offer what truly matters. Yeah. Through God, we are told being so we live life. Yeah. We know that the truth, we know the truth, even though others do not. So we live lives. We make those stories. The cool of waters and shoulders, where we used to do. Where we used to go. Where we used to have. Baby, the reason why I'm on this futon today, because I'm sitting here. We live lies sometimes, man. We live lies. We live lies because she did it all. She took it all. She she was just all and all and all. What you do? Nothing. I was just the nicest brother ever. We all know it takes two to tango. But she all stayed on the throne, knowing that the throne would not. So here Samuel followed him through and he arrived in Bethlehem and immediately the elders went out to meet him and instead of just welcoming him and making him feel at home, the text says that they came trembling and wanted to know if Samuel came peacefully or not. And what wonders why they will react like that. Especially in the time of hospitality was a high priority. Well, the answer is found in chapter 15. And when we read it, that we read that it was Samuel after Saul's apparent disobedience that killed Agar. The king of the Malachites. So Samuel is a little gangster prophet. We're going to sword and kick him butt and take a name. So that's why the people, when he showed up, look, you come peacefully or not. Look, what's going on? Do we need to hear up? But I want to speak to a larger issue. In fact, for many men, we always believing that other men are always being confrontational. Especially our young men. Sometimes we cannot even look another man in the eye for a length of time without feeling that they wanted to do something to us. Now that, that kind of posturing has got many men locked up and even killed. Anger is placed on our women and significant others to a point where, where we cause harm to the people we profess to love. All right. Spirit of hostility, rank discord, and confrontation is bad enough. But add no money and liquor and hot weather. <laughs> we have a combustible combination in a situation. I recently read a study where men, right around my age, they don't have any real friends. <laughs> no folk, we you know, hang out a little every now and then, but, but that true real friend that we have maybe in our 20s and 30s, especially when we were younger, somehow we don't have that in us. Because to have a real friend, one must be open. Yeah. Must even show some vulnerability. Yeah, right. So to get past the confrontation mm. standards, and Samuel begins looking for a new king. He first took a look at Eli. And he immediately thought that that was the one, but Samuel gets a shock when he hears God saying that's not the one. Mm. That was not so bad. <laughs> but 
is the way, it, it, it is why he was not the one that would have shot Samuel. Don't look at his appearance on the height of his statue because I have rejected him. The Lord does not see his mortal seed. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. This would have shocked Samuel because this was the same criteria that everybody looked at when they picked Saul. Yeah. Samuel was just following the pattern, but now he hears directly from the Lord that Saul was not really the choice to begin with. Now Samuel could have fought, Samuel could have anointed Eli, and nothing would have been said about the anointing. I mean, he looked apart and everything would have been a go. But Samuel knew what he heard, and he knew that he was guilty of looking at outward appearances and selecting leadership. Samuel acknowledges his wrong by continuing to look at God's anointing, to look for God's anointing. And for many men, Sometimes it's hard to admit sometimes, man, when we are wrong. Mm. Amen. Always somebody else's fault. Always somebody else's problem. They just don't understand me when we say something. That's right, because many times we don't understand ourselves. Stop blaming. Sometimes the blame is because we have not done the introspective work we need to do to make ourselves not only just better men but better humans better servants of the Lord we need to reclaim our own interests and discern what it is that we can do even in a messed up situation just like Samuel, we learn that everything that looks good on the outside is not good for us. I know she looks good on the outside. I know it looks good to your eyes. I know that the situation looks good. I know that certain things can feel good, but I came to remind somebody that everything that looks good, tastes good, and feels good is not good for you. It's time that we own up to some of our mistakes and learn from them and not get tripped up over them again. The growth of a human, the growth of a man, is to say, I know that trap not going down anymore. Stuff's tripping you up every year. <laughs> That's why men can be great mentors to other young men. Son, you don't no, tell you that. I know this. So Samuel continues to look for God's anointing, and after all of Jesse's sons passed by, Samuel asked, oh, all your sons here, I know I'm in the right place, I know I hear from the Lord, I know I should anoint somebody here, I know that I'm here in the right place, so all, all your sons here, and I like that, because Samuel showed some patience, and he did not want to act quickly, and so many times, we find ourselves in trouble, only to know that if we had just slowed up a little, if we would have had enough patience, we could have been better off. How many times have we rushed the decision? How many times we rushed to pick and choosing something that felt good at the time but only caused problems down the road? Any one of Jesse's sons would have been okay. Anyone would have been the right one. No one would have objected at all. But the problem was that they were not the right ones. Nothing wrong with them in and of themselves. They're just not the right ones for that job. Right. Sometimes you gotta stop finding your worth in a job, in a position, and in a title. Just because you're not right for one position does not mean that you're not right for the other position. I know sometimes it's a tough not being picked or chosen, but I came to declare that sometimes it's a blessing in this guy. And I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that sometimes God no overrode my yes. If it was up to me, the things that I asked for. The things that I thought I wanted. The things that I thought would have made me feel good. The things that I thought would have been my blessing. God said no. And I don't know about you this morning. 
but I would have been in trouble. But God said no. Yeah. If it were up to me, I would have been broke, busted, and disgusted. Yeah. But God said no. If it was up to me, I would have gone down the wrong road. But God said no. If it were up to me, I would have kept making the same wrong decisions over and over and over again. But God said, boy, I told you no. What we need is to recognize that the blessing in God's no and walk in the assurance that what God has for me is better than I could even imagine. I don't know about you, but God's no has saved me many times before. It has kept me out of the murking bar. It has kept me out of a mess. It has got me out of some messes. It kept me from going that way and that way and back there, but to stand still. And it kept me to keep on moving forward. God's no can be a blessing in disguise. God's no can be your way out. God's no can be your way up. God's no can be your way out. So after asking all your sons here, Jesse said, yeah, but there, there, there's one more remaining. He, he, he's the youngest. He's out there keeping sheep. So Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him. For we will not sit down until he comes here. They went and got the youngest. And the text says that he was ruddy, had beautiful eyes, and was handsome. In short, even though he was good looking and had beautiful eyes, he still didn't fit the part. He still wouldn't have been the one that you would have picked to be the next king. Now don't miss this. He comes from outside tending the sheep. So he wasn't dressed the best. He wasn't smelling the best. He didn't look the best. He just showed up. Yeah, daddy, what you want? I was out there tending the sheep. Can I get back out there tending some more sheep? He still did not warn the first look. He didn't even warn Jesse, even having him available for Samuel to even notice him. Let me just stop right there and to tell you, what if your own daddy didn't think that you were good enough to even be in the lineup? If your own daddy enough for you to come on in and say get clean up boy get clean up because Samuel is picking a new king it tells me a lot that Jesse his own daddy didn't think that he could be the one he's out in the back tending sheep minding his own business doing what he did every day but his life was about to change oh when this young rusty and dusty dirty shepherd came into the room Samuel heard the Lord say, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of all his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mighty upon David from that day forward. Samuel singing that his work was done. He got up and went back home. Hallelujah. And I don't want you just to miss that. I know you want to shout on David's anointing. Someone who was really an afterthought. But that's not the real reason to shout. The real place to shout is the fact that David is anointed by Samuel while Saul is still king. In other words, to the regular eye, Saul is still king. But something was happening in the spirit realm. Something powerful was taking place. God was shifting, ordering and reordering stuff into place. So much so that after the anointing, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David. In short, David was anointed, but yet not appointed. And I just stopped by here to tell somebody this morning to recognize the Spirit working in this place. I believe we have some men up in here upon first look. Nobody might consider leaders. Upon first look, nobody would consider scholars. Upon first look, nobody could think they could lead ministry. Upon first look, nobody could think they could be deacons or ministers. Upon first look, nobody would believe they were on their own businesses. Upon first look, nobody would think they could serve as a mentor. Upon first look, nobody would believe they would be helpful and a blessing to everybody. Upon first look, nobody would think they could do anything. They hail from places like North Memphis and Dixie Homes and Scullfield and South Memphis, rural Mississippi, rural Alabama, backwater towns, ghettos of all across this nation. You may think that these men here can't do anything, but I came to tell you men that you are anointed, but yet not a part. 
do we do while the breakthrough tears? What do we do while I wait on the full manifestation? What do I do while we wait? Well, that's what I want to talk about in the next couple of weeks. But, but, but I just want to say something right here. Just keep doing what you've been doing. But now you're doing it under and anointed. You miss your shot right there. For you see, you've been laboring all the time while folk may have talked about you. While folk laughed at you. While folk thought that you were no good. While folk didn't even put you in the lineup to even consider that you could be the person that you were claiming to be. But now you got an anointing. And the good news this morning is that when David got healed, it was in front of everybody. And that minute everybody saw it. And I came to tell somebody, especially our men, that God is not through with you yet. Some of you have been toiling for a long time. But I came to tell you, you're toiling under the anointing. And God is not through with you yet. There's still work needed to be done because God is not through with you yet. I know folk don't see it, but God is not through with you yet. God not through with our men. God got a plan for the men. God got a purpose for the men. God would double our size next year. God would send more men our way. God would bless us with men. Men of power. Men of grace, men of hope, men of love, men of abundance, and yes, yes, men that will get in your face and tell you what you need to be told if you get out of line. Men, God is not through with us yet, and if you keep on working, you keep on pressing, you keep on pushing, you keep on keeping on, God will not only anoint you, and the good news right here, here's your place to shout. God would not only anoint you, but God would do it right in the same, right in the face of the same folk who counted you out. Right in the folk of the folk who've been talking about you. Right in the face of the folk who were laughing at you. Right in the face of the folk who were kicking you to the curb. Right in the face of the folk who said you were going to be like your daddy. You were going to be no bad. You ain't gonna be nothing. You ain't gonna be no good. You just gonna be spanking all your life. Oh God, we'll bless you right in front of those folks. And all I want you to do when that day comes is just smile and bless the people. And say, you don't know what I know. God is not through with me. I'm alone. I might not yet be appointed to my final destiny. But God is definitely not through with me yet. I don't know about you, but I'm proud of the men of Jila. The men of Jila. The men of that. We march in